Hello and welcome to our fourth CARS webcast of 2021. My name is Brad Bell. I'm the William J. Conady Professor of Strategic Human Resources and the Director of the Center for Advanced Human Resource Studies here in the ILR School at Cornell. Given that the COVID-19 pandemic has forced most corporate training to go online over the past year, I thought this would be a good opportunity to step back and look at what we know about the effectiveness of virtual learning, as well as some of the issues, as well as opportunities that it might present uh, going forward. During the webcast, I would like to encourage you to participate. Uh, you can share your comments as well as questions through either the chat function or the Q&A function here in Zoom. Uh, I hopefully will have some time at the end to uh, field some of your questions. What I hope to do over the next 30 minutes or so is start out by looking at you know, the evolution of e-learning over the past few decades, you know, pre, during, as well as what we think is going to happen post-pandemic. Like to look at what we know about the effectiveness of virtual learning relative to more traditional in-person learning, as well as some of the factors that we know can influence the effectiveness of technology-based training. And then I'll wrap up by discussing you know, what are some of the issues that we need to be aware of going forward uh, as virtual learning perhaps becomes a larger portion of our training portfolio, as well as what might be some of the opportunities that we can take advantage of uh, going forward. So let's start out by looking at, again, the evolution of virtual learning, some of the trends that have been taking place. And I thought the place to begin would be really kind of thinking about, you know, how is e-learning uh, evolving leading up to the uh, pandemic. And what we've seen certainly over the last few decades is a tremendous increase in the amount of training that is delivered through technology. If you go back, you know, as recently as, you know, the early 2000s, what you found was only about 10% of training was delivered through technology. Whereas in 2019, right before the pandemic, uh, we saw that that figure had increased to 40% of training being delivered through some form of technology. The majority of that was based, was more kind of self-directed uh, as opposed to instructor-led training. Uh, so individuals doing online you know, programs as opposed to kind of live instructor uh, virtual-led uh, programs. What's interesting is while we've seen this tremendous increase in virtual learning, we also at the same time haven't seen the demise of the classroom, which you know, some had been uh, predicting for some time. And in fact, prior to the pandemic, we actually saw that uh, instructor-led live face-to-face -face classroom was still the dominant delivery mechanism for corporate training, over 50% about you know, depending on the survey you look, look at, about 55 to 60% of training was still being done in that face-to-face -face, uh, traditional environment. What's also interesting is that if you look at kind of the, the trends of e-learning over the last you know, decade or so, what we've seen is that uh, it's kind of plateaued in the sense of going back to as recently as about 2011, around 40% of training at that time was being delivered via technology. And that's basically what we were seeing in 2019, which led many to question whether we had kind of pushed out as much training as we could realistically do over technology and maybe hit kind of a ceiling. You know, there have been predictions for a number of years that some new technologies, whether it was mobile or virtual reality, might lead to kind of a, a new wave of e-learning but we really hadn't seen that materialize. Uh, in fact, those kind of mobile uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, those methods still were a very small slice of the overall kind of corporate training portfolios. Obviously, this kind of ceiling was smashed, you might say, uh, during the pandemic, uh, when you know, much of corporate training was shifted you know, to online. So it might be viewed as really kind of creating this opportunity to rethink uh, the possibilities for what could be delivered through technology. You know, what various reports, including this 2020 training industry report show is that um, companies did put a decent amount of their training on hold during the pandemic. Uh, widely variable, uh, some companies it was, you know, maybe 
you know, five to 10% of training was put on hold and others as much as 75% or more. Um, so we did see some kind of pausing where companies looked at certain programs and felt like they couldn't be converted to virtual um, or maybe would just be better off waiting until they could be delivered again in a more kind of traditional in-person uh, setting. The remainder of training though was converted to some form of virtual delivery. And what we see is that in that same survey, a majority of respondents plan to return to classroom training post pandemic, while also maintaining some of the remote training, right? So again, we see this where the kind of virtual learning was maybe used as a stopgap measure for some programs, whereas others, it's really created an opportunity to re-envision how those programs are gonna be delivered uh, over the long term. The 2020 uh, learning state of the industry report by chief learning officer found unsurprisingly, given these trends that we just talked about, that e-learning delivery is expected to be the top anticipated area of L&D technology spending over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. In addition, self-paced e-learning as well as mobile learning are really expected to be uh, the two delivery methods that increase the most. And again, uh, not surprisingly, classroom-based learning is expected to be the delivery mode that increases the least over the next year, year and a half. So it appears that at least over the near term, we expect to see somewhat of the tables turn, going from this model where classroom face-to-face -face was still the dominant delivery mode to where for at least some period of time, we're likely to see e-learning, virtual learning really kind of take a dominant role. This kind of shift raises a number of you know, important questions, probably the, the most fundamental of which is, you know, is virtual learning effective? Um, or are we sacrificing quality to some extent by moving training from the classroom to some form of technology-based delivery? Over the last several decades, literally thousands of studies have examined uh, this question. Uh, looking across many different types of technology, uh, as well as different types of learners and, and learning uh, content. The typical study that you'd see in this area would take a uh, particular learning program or training program and would offer presumably comparison, comparable forms of it, one usually in person, face-to-face, -face, and another through some form of technology. And then at the end, what we would do is compare uh, outcomes across learners in terms of their attitudes, in terms of their learning gain, skill gain, et cetera, to see how the technology-based form of the program compared to the more traditional form. And what meta-analyses of these studies have consistently revealed is that all else equal, learning outcomes tend to be equivalent in the same course delivered through technology as delivered through more traditional classroom in-person instruction. So on the one hand, that's maybe reassuring to know that in general, we tend to find that e-learning, virtual learning really doesn't uh, lead to uh, detrimental kind of uh, learning outcomes, uh, which is important because a lot of surveys show that there's still, you know, among the general public, a perception that technology-based learning tends to be on, in general, lower quality learning than more traditional in-person instruction. And the evidence doesn't really bear that out. That being said, it's important to call attention to this all else equal statement that I put in that uh, you know, conclusion. You know, what you find if you look at these studies that again, you know, try to compare technology-based and more traditional learning is that it's really difficult um, to, to create equivalent versions of a particular training program that's offered through different delivery media. What you often find is that by offering the content or through these different mediums, you often end up with other types of differences that seep in. For example, if a program is delivered through technology, learners may have more opportunity to go back and review content or even just to spend more time uh, in learning. Or in the classroom, it may be possible to uh, more actively engage learners, uh, maybe with interacting with the content or interacting with peers or even the instructors. 
So you have to be really careful when looking at these studies to really assess, are, is the instruction that's being offered uh, equivalent across these different media? But when these studies have been able to really kind of control for these differences, what you find is that there's really nothing uniquely advantageous uh, to any particular delivery medium. Or as edu educational psychologist Richard Clark uh, once stated, media only deliver instruction, but do not influence learning. Thus, the question is not really whether um, virtual learning should be used, but really when it should be used. And that requires consideration of whether the technology can deliver the desired instructional experience. In other words, we should be really thinking about what are the learning objectives or goals of a particular program? What is the type of instructional experience that we need to create for people to actually achieve those goals? And then we should look at, are we able to uh, appropriately deliver that instructional experience through some form of technology? If the answer is yes, then it's likely that e-learning will be effective. If the answer is no, then we really should be thinking about, again, do we pause this program or think about other ways to deliver it? Given that, you know, over the years, these findings have kind of highlighted that, uh, you know, the does it work question is really not that uh, meaningful. Research in recent years has kind of shifted attention from, you know, is e-learning e or virtual learning effective to really looking more at, well, what are those factors that make e-learning more or less effective? And research to date has highlighted a number of differences or factors here that really uh, do make uh, an important impact. The first is this idea of interactivity. You know, E-learning programs that offer moderate to high levels of interaction have been shown to consistently lead to better learning outcomes than those offering less interactivity. Interestingly, research does suggest that the type of interaction matters. In particular, programs that offer students an opportunity to interact with one another, other students, or to really engage actively with the content tend to produce better outcomes than those that emphasize more student instructor or student teacher interaction. So this suggests thinking about how to make our e-learning programs really actively engaging, particularly in terms of kind of student discussion and interaction, as well as you know, ways for students to really dig into the content can help to enhance e-learning outcomes. We also know that learner satisfaction with the technology interface, in particular, its usability has been shown to have a significant impact on their reactions as well as their subsequent learning outcomes. In addition, we know that technical problems have been shown to be one of the primary reasons that individuals drop out of e-learning, which has important implications as we think about individuals or employees access to certain types of technology like broadband internet access, which really may shape their experience with the program and their not only learning outcomes, but their likelihood of completing a program, something we'll, we'll come back to and talk about uh, in a second. And finally, a number of studies have shown that learning outcomes tend to be greatest in blended learning programs that combine virtual and face-to-face -face elements. And certainly this makes sense, right? Because it really allows us to take advantage uh, of the best of both worlds in the sense that we can you know, really take the advantage of that in-person uh, experience to, again, to drive that interactivity, whereas we can leverage uh, the benefits of more virtual learning to either have on-ramps and off-ramps of a program or to present ways for students to interact with the content in, uh, through different media, for example, or in different uh, ways. I see a few questions that have come in through the chat and Q&A, and uh, I will get to those here in a second. I uh, would encourage you again, if you have other questions or comments, please do feel free to, to share them and we'll have some time here at the end to, to tackle a few of these. So as companies expand their virtual learning offerings, you know, what are some of the issues and opportunities that they should be looking out for? 
So in terms of issues, you know, both you in the US and globally, um, there continue to exist what we call digital divides based on income such that lower income individuals are less likely to have broadband internet access. Although the gap it has shown signs of narrowing, which is, which is encouraging, uh, companies still need to be careful in avoiding assuming that employees are gonna have access, ready access to the technology needed for virtual learning. And again, going back to that point, if, if employees don't have access or have kind of degraded technology access, particularly when they're engaging in these, this learning remotely from home, uh, it may really reduce their satisfaction. It may lead them to be more likely to drop out if they continue to experience technical difficulties or interruptions. So something that companies really need to be aware of. There's also research that suggests that uh, academically underprepared students fare worse in virtual learning. So a lot of this has been done in college settings, looking at kind of student differences in terms of who learns better or worse in e-learning. And what we find is that students that uh, maybe are more underprepared or have lower GPAs often struggle more with online learning than other students. Uh, and part of that is because they haven't developed maybe well-developed learning strategies that are really critical in online and virtual learning because so much of it tends to be self-directed. And so again, you know, we might see some of this carry over into work settings where em employees that maybe don't have uh, the same experience or background with kind of self-directed learning or maybe haven't had an opportunity to develop some of those effective learning strategies may need greater support and guidance as they go through uh, virtual learning. Another important thing for companies to think about is the effects of virtual learning on different types of learning outcomes. You know, one of the shortcomings of the academic research in this area is that much of it has really focused on learners' reactions or attitudes, as well as their kind of immediate cognitive learning outcomes, you know, knowledge, uh, things like that. What we don't know a lot about or really has not been well examined is what are the effects of virtual learning on kind of long-term retention and transfer. You know, most academic studies, if they even look at retention at all, it's maybe a month or so after the, the training. So really not long-term retention and very little focus on transfer. Obviously these are outcomes that are of paramount importance in kind of corporate settings. Uh, so we'll definitely want to be something that companies monitor and evaluate on a regular basis in really assessing the effectiveness of different virtual learning programs within their portfolio. Now, on the flip side, I do think this kind of uh, shift to e-learning does create some exciting uh, opportunities. You know, in higher education, what we've seen is that e-learning has really been kind of lauded as this opportunity to expand access to underserved populations, right? For example, individuals that may not be able to participate in quote unquote traditional uh, higher education because of full-time work responsibilities or maybe family care responsibilities. And in my conversations with companies over the last year, I think we're seeing or hearing of similar things happening in the corporate setting as well, where you know, e-learning has really allowed companies to expand access to their learning. No longer is participation limited by the size of the classroom or even geographical constraints. And so I think there's really an opportunity for broaden e-learning to really democratize learning within corporations and make learning, you know, available to a, and more learning available to a wider swath of our employees. I also think that there is an opportunity going forward to really leverage some of these new technologies. As I mentioned earlier, we haven't yet seen really kind of um, broad adoption of things like mobile learning uh, or virtual reality or augmented reality. Yet, I think you know, we're seeing this uptick and the pandemic might really kind of accelerate the adoption of those technologies going forward. And when it does, I think what we're likely to see is expanded opportunities to deliver things that we probably didn't think in the past were a good fit for virtual learning through some of these new technologies. For example, virtual reality 
can make training that maybe has really um, active or kinesthetic elements much more feasible to deliver through technology uh, than we thought in the past. So it'll be really interesting to see if these technologies can lead to this you know, kind of new wave of e-learning adoption, and also whether these new technologies, maybe in contrast to prior technologies, really do create opportunities to expand as well as increase the effectiveness of e-learning, maybe even doing some things that we can't do in the typical kind of in-person classroom-based setting. So with that, I'd like to uh, take a moment to field some of the questions uh, that are coming in. Um, so starting with a question here from Cecilia, uh, asks, you know, which would be the environmental elements that are being considered as constants in the studies that being equal would produce the same outcomes on tech-based and traditional training? Yeah, so good question, Cecilia. Um, you know, a lot of times what, what these, uh, what we're trying to control for is, again, differences in the nature of the instruction itself. So for example, uh, how active or passive in, is instruction? How much time do people have to really engage with the learning program? How much feedback uh, are they maybe getting uh, as they go through the learning? And so, you know, there's different opportunities for each of these instructional elements, often across technology or classroom settings. And when they differ, what we might see as differences in learning because of differences in those instructional elements as opposed to the technology itself. So when these various meta-analyses have controlled or held constant, again, things like activity or interactivity, feedback, time spent in learning, that's where we tend to see any of these technology-based differences disappear, which leads us to the conclusion that it's really about you know, the nature of the instruction as opposed to the delivery mechanism per se. So um, a question here from Nancy, from a, a manufacturing perspective, uh, is the data shared about classroom versus virtual being almost equal in effect? Is it relevant for that production uh, type of employee? Yeah, so I, you know, Nancy, good question. Again, this research has been done across uh, a variety of different, you know, types of learning learners as well as uh, learning content. I would say that I think if you look at a lot of these studies, they do skew towards more focusing on what you think of as really uh, teaching more declarative cognitive knowledge, right, as opposed to more hands-on skills. Though there have been, you know, studies that have looked at more kind of hands-on training, and we tend to see similar effects there as well, which which suggests we would likely see uh, similar findings in your kind of more manufacturing or production type setting. You know, but we certainly do have much more uh, focus or knowledge about more kind of declarative knowledge, cognitive learning, as opposed to more hands-on. Uh, type learning. Uh, a couple other questions here. Um, question about uh, when employees access uh, content out of their work environment, they're using their personal data plans as likely paying out of your pocket, which can also be a negative for employees. So uh, more of a comment than a, a question, but a, a good one. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly, I think, you know, it goes back to the access issues that we really need to be conscious about. You know, if employees are living in areas or regions where they maybe do not have access to broadband, are they going to have to uh, be paying for their own access? And, you know, certainly something companies will need to think about in terms of either do we subsidize that? Uh, do we create, you know, uh, learning centers you know, when it's possible, again, to have people back in some physical location? Do we create learning centers where people can? Uh, access certain forms of technology. A couple other uh, questions here. You know, one person's asking, you know, when do we think uh, classroom training will resume? Uh, I think that's probably the million dollar question. Uh, you know, I think that's really, again, going to be highly variable across companies, depending on when, when companies are bringing employees back to the office, you know, 
uh, back to physical locations. I think it's also likely to depend on where companies are in that, you know, continuing of putting programs on pause versus converting things in the, you know, over the last year to more remote training. My guess is that we're likely to see some kind of in-person training uh, resume uh, at the end of this year. Uh, probably most of it will, I would guess, would start to really rebound in 2021. But I know from talking to some companies that they've really made the decision, you know, over the you know, next few years to really stay in this virtual mode of delivery. So I, I think it's going to depend a lot, again, on, you know, who we're training, what we're training, and just kind of the comfort and, and acceptance of some of these virtual forms of learning uh, across our different companies. Another comp uh, question here about uh, virtual engagement. Person kind of highlights that uh, engaging learners in remote training has uh, been a challenge that they've experienced. Uh, you know, and are there things that companies are thinking about in that space? It's a it's a great question. Uh, I think it's an important issue to to keep an eye on going forward. That training industry report that I highlighted earlier, uh, about 20% of the companies in that survey uh, cited their biggest challenge throughout the pandemic has really been engaging learners in remote training. And again, in my conversations with companies, I think what we've seen is this has fluctuated over time. In fact, early in the pandemic when uh, Individuals were quarantined. They didn't have a whole lot of options for doing much else. I think we actually saw a surge in demand for learning because people were really using it as an opportunity to uh, take advantage of the downtime to maybe engage in, in more development. I think that has waned a bit over time, in part because we're all just so fatigued with online anything, Zoom meetings, you know, online, being online, that I think uh, some of that has flattened out. So I think, you know, going forward again, I think the hybrid model will be the most effective one. I think people will be craving some of that in-person contact and interaction that they get from in-person face-to-face training, while also wanting some of that flexibility to engage in virtual learning. Uh, you know, again, maybe in those pockets of time that they can work it in. So I think you know companies are going to want to try to strike that right balance between the face-to-face -face and and more virtual uh, models. So I want to be conscious of time. I know we're right at the uh, half past here on the hour. Uh, just before I wrap up, just want to highlight some upcoming uh, Cars events that we have. Uh, in late May, we're actually hosting a, a virtual spring partner meeting. Normally, we just do a fall meeting. But we decided to add a spring meeting this year where we'll be presenting out different streams of research that we've been doing this semester around diversity, equity, inclusion. So I would encourage you to sign up for that meeting uh, if DEI is uh, a topic of interest to you. Uh, we also have two webcasts uh, in early June that will be presenting out work that we've been doing across different working groups this semester. Uh, we did a series on the post-pandemic work and workplace, looking at plans for return to the office, thinking about uh, managing hybrid uh, work, as well as really thinking about how do we reset the culture going forward, uh, as well as another working group series that we did on how the pandemic is reshaping or causing companies to rethink the HR operating model uh, going forward. So again, two webcasts. That will be summarizing some of the work that we've been doing on those important topics. You can find all of these events as well as register for them on our website, which is cars.ilr.cornell.edu. So please do visit the website and hope to see you at one of our future CARS events. Thanks again for attending today.